The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Since the Equitable Life Assurance Society was founded 90 years ago, this country has changed in many ways. But in one respect, it is still the same. In those early days, people always spoke of America as the land of opportunity. It still is just as much as ever. In just a few minutes, in tonight's middle commercial, the Equitable Society will have a special message for listeners who agree with this philosophy. We will describe a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up, offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file... The Fugitive Bridegroom. Perhaps the best set of rules ever devised for human conduct is also the oldest. The rules written on the two tables of stone. The rules we know as the Ten Commandments. One of those canons is... Thou shalt not kill. The record of the number of times that commandment is broken is a matter of national concern. For in the year just past, there were thousands of people murdered. These murders occurred in every section of the country and formed a solid core in the midst of the million and a half major crimes committed in 1948. Some people were murdered in the middle of a large city, almost within arm's reach of help. And others, well... Other murders, like the one in tonight's case, from the files of your FBI, took place far from any crowd and far from any help. Tonight's file opens at a resort hotel in the snow country. It is early evening and the skating rink beside the Twin Lakes Lodge is crowded. In one corner of the rink, a young man is, well, being a young man. Jones! Jones! What's this? What's it going to be? A triple twister with a double reverse. Oh, this I want to see. Okay, now what? Now, here goes. <laughs> oh, Tom, that was perfect. <laughs> I usually break a leg. Oh, don't do that. Who'd take me to the bond then? Hey, <laughs> when's that? Tomorrow night. No kidding. Time really flies, doesn't it? Now, when I'm with you, Josh, all these past ten days have had wings. I've loved them. Honest? Honest. Johnny! Torres calling you. Johnny! Oh, what is it? Come here, will you? Excuse me, Tom. Sure. Hey, hey, look. Why don't you take off your skates and I'll meet you at the sleigh. Okay. Hi, Cora. Hi. Look, honey, I don't want to spoil your fun, but there's a phone call at the shack for you. It's the man you're engaged to. Well? Uh-huh. Did you talk to him? Yeah. When did he get into town? Just tonight. Cora, do me a favor. What? Go in and tell him you couldn't find me. Tom, what time tomorrow do we go skiing? Skiing. Okay. What time tomorrow do we go skiing? Well, as soon after lunch as you can get away. Fine. Oh, poor boy. Well, here we are. Your home. So soon? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, Tom, it's been a wonderful evening. I loved it, too. Good night. Good night, honey. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Gee, boy. Gee, get out. Get out. 
Hello, Joan. Oh, Bruce. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to scare you. Here are your keys. Thanks. I, I've been waiting here for you to come home. When did you get back? Just tonight. Oh. Well, aren't, aren't you glad to see me? Sure. I, uh, I called you every place. I didn't get any messages. Oh, weren't you at the rink? Yes. Well, I called there. It was very crowded tonight. Oh. Uh, who was that? Hmm? Who was the fellow you were with? A friend. Looked like a pretty close friend. Oh, now, Ralph. Well, he was kissing That's you. That's right. Would you give everyone that privilege? Look, this is all pretty pointless. Pointless? Joan, we're engaged. I don't want to discuss this. But Joan... It's late. I've got to go to bed. Joan. Good night, Ralph. Meanwhile, at a nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Leon King. Leon, how close are you to finishing the Anderson case? I'm just doing my report on it now, Jim. Well, the SAC said that as soon as you were finished, we were to start working together on a new one. Came in this morning. No, what is it? Probably murder. What do you mean, probably? Well, the body of a woman about 23 years old was found buried in the snow up at Great Bear National Park. Uh-huh. Police were called in first. They started an investigation, but they couldn't find any means of identifying the woman. Uh, how long had she been dead? Oh, about two to three weeks. There was some indication she'd been struck on the back of the head, but so far it hasn't been determined whether she sustained that injury when she fell or whether she was actually struck by someone. Was her clothing checked? Uh, the police sent them on to our lab in Washington. She's wearing an old leather belt, and by using the infrared, they brought up some crude printing. Turned out to be a name, Mary Travis. Mm, well, did the police learn where she was staying at Great Bear? No, not yet. I spent most of the morning checking around town here to see if I could find any of her friends or relatives. Why here? Oh, there was a uh, small gold-plated bracelet around her wrist. Had a tiny perfume dispenser attached to it. Yes. Well, on one side of the dispenser, it said Mary, and on the other, compliments of the key club. I've seen those. Well, I checked at the club. They gave out those dispensers as New Year's Eve souvenirs. Uh, did you find anybody there who knew the girl? No. However, I learned her parents have a whole family. Well, did you see them? No, they're traveling in Europe. Oh, fine. Well, I contacted them. I cabled them the news of their daughter's death. They're flying back on a plane which makes a connection at New York with another plane that gets them out here tomorrow afternoon. Good. Leon, why don't you finish your report on the Anderson case tonight if you can? Okay, Jim. We can start checking on the girl's background again first thing in the morning. <laughs> Hello, Cora. Uh, oh, hi, Ralph. Welcome back. Thanks. Say, how do you like my friend here? <laughs> Quite a snowman. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm trying to make up my mind about the nose. But I don't know whether to use an icicle or a carrot. Cora, have you seen Joan? Hmm? Oh, not this morning. Well, did you catch up with her last night? Yeah. Bet she was surprised, huh? Well, you could call it that. Say, Cora, who's the guy? Hmm? Well, who do you mean? The one she's been going with. Oh, well, I don't know. I saw them to... together last night. Oh. Who is he? Well, his name's Tom Chandler. He checked in at the lodge ten days ago. Well, has she seen a lot of him? Look, Ralph, no fair. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I think I know the answer anyway. Ralph, I don't want to get involved, but... Well, after all, you... You did go away. Well, I went for only one reason. To make some money to marry Joan. <laughs> the funny part is, I made the money. Look, even bought a ring. Oh, Ralph, that's beautiful. Well, I don't think I'll have much use for it now. Oh, that's no way to talk. Get in there and fight. Get that other boy some competition. Say, there's a barn dance tonight. Joan's going to be there. With him? Well, I imagine so, but that'd be a good place for you to start. <laughs> I've got a better place to start. Where? The nearest bar. Oh, brother, that airport. You been out there all afternoon? Yeah, the plane was two hours late. Did you talk to the girl's parents, Jim? Yeah, it wasn't too easy. What did you find out? 
Mr. Travis told me that his daughter had written and told him of going to Great Bear to do some skiing. Uh huh. Later, she wrote and said that she had met someone up there and married him. A man named Fred Jones. And unfortunately, that's about all they know about him. You mean she didn't mention what he did or where he came from? No. Well, where is he now? They didn't know that either. That's pretty strange behavior, Jim. Well, this is even stranger. Travis told me that his daughter lived alone in an apartment here in town. She, she... must have had money. Yes, that's right, from an aunt. Well, we went to her bank. She kept a safe deposit box. We found that they had received a visit from the girl and her husband. She wanted him to be a joint owner and be able to open the box, too. Was this arranged? Yes, and according to the bank's record, the new husband came to the bank a week ago and emptied the box. After the girl was dead? That's right. Her father said that he knows of at least $5,000 in cash that his daughter had in the box in addition to various securities. Jim, could anyone in the bank describe Fred Jones? Oh, not a soul. Well, it sounds like that's our next job. I'll get it there. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Mr. Taylor. This is Lieutenant Henderson of the Great Bear. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Well, we've made a little progress. Good. Oh, did you uh, find out where the girl was staying? Yeah, she was living at the Chestnut Inn until she got married. Uh-huh. And she and her husband rented a cabin someplace up here, but we haven't located that yet. Well, thanks for calling, Lieutenant. Just as soon as we can sign out of here, Leon King and I will be on our way up to see you. <laughs> Surprised to see me? Well, I decided to take your advice. You've also been taking one more. <laughs> sure. Hey, hey, where's Joe? I, I don't know. I want to get another look at her, her new boyfriend. Uh, he's not here. Oh, now look. Well, no, I haven't seen either one of them all night. Well, you told me she was coming here. Well, she must have changed her mind. Oh, no. Now, you'll be a good little boy and go home. Hey, hey, here she is. But he... <laughs> I knew you were trying to fool me. That's a new fellow she's dancing with. You know, I think I'll go over and meet him. Oh, wait, Ralph. <laughs> no, no. I want to shake hands with my competition. Uh... Shake hands with my competition. <laughs> Hello. Can I cut in? No, Ralph. Why not? Answer me. Why not? I don't think she has to give a reason. I'm not talking to you. Joan, can't you give me a reason? Please. Look, uh, I think we've had enough of this. What do you mean? We. Let's say I've had enough. Ah, uh, get out of my way. Oh, no. Uh, if you want a reason, too, I'll give you one. Joan is my wife. Open tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now, a special message to a very special kind of person. To the man or woman who can truthfully say to himself, I'm on the way up. Yes, we're talking to the kind of man who knows that someday his boss will call him and say, Jim, we're making you head of your department starting next Monday. If you're that type of person with unshakable confidence in yourself and your future, then make sure you have life insurance designed to order for you. Right now, investigate the Equitable Society's special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. To people of all ages who expect to be earning more money five years from now than they are today, this plan offers three important advantages. First, immediate protection. The moment you sign the contract, you enjoy the peace of mind that comes from knowing that your wife and children have the protection they need. Second... The equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. In other words, your life insurance keeps in step with your income. Third advantage, the equitable plan is flexible at all times. It can expand or contract as you see fit and offers you many desirable options which your equitable society representative will be glad to explain to you. 
So why not get in touch with him immediately? Phone him soon and ask for full details on the equitable plan for people on the way up. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Fugitive Bridegroom. two men in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, and it appears that one of them is a murderer, a wanton killer for profit. There are differences between them almost as great as there can possibly be between two people, and yet, despite those differences, either one of them could be the killer, for there is no mold into which people are poured, and which makes one man a murderer and the other man incapable of it. In its various investigations into what adds up to thousands of murders, your law enforcement agencies and your FBI have learned that there are no such things as physical characteristics which can serve to identify any criminal, and least of all, a murderer. Murders have been committed by men and women in every age group, of every income group, of every race and creed. So don't make any snap decision about which of the two men in tonight's case is the actual killer. Because thus far, only one thing is true. It could be either one. Tonight's file continues at police headquarters at Great Bear. Special Agents King and Taylor are being greeted by Lieutenant Henderson. Good to see you again, gentlemen. Well, thanks, Lieutenant. Well, I'm afraid I haven't got too much to report to you. Well, did you locate the cabin that the honeymooners used? Not yet. I got a detail working on it. We should get some words soon. Uh -huh. uh, what have you been able to pick up on the missing husband, Lieutenant? Well, very little. He called himself Fred Jones, but the chances are that was an alias. Yes, that's true. He'd worked at a local ski shop for about a week. When he married Miss Travis, he quit his job. Well, Lieutenant, could anyone around there give you a description on him? Yes, but it was too general. No outstanding features or characteristics. I interviewed a dozen people around there. I... Uh, here. Here are the descriptions of him. Uh, thanks, Lieutenant. Uh, uh, where did he come from, Lieutenant? Oh, no. He just dropped his, drifted in and got the job. I think... Excuse me. Lieutenant Henderson speaking. Hello, Lieutenant. Sergeant Newton. We located the honeymooners' cabin. Oh, good. It's up at the end of Pine Trail. The place with the double chimney? Yeah, that's it. Thanks, Sergeant. I'll get up there right away. Am I still oh. welcome around here, Cora? Oh. oh, how do you feel, Ralph? Awful. How's the chin? Sore. <laughs> we'll sit down and rest it, huh? Thanks. Sit well? Not right now. Cora. Yes? Do I remember right? Did Joan get married? Yes. Well, that's that. Ralph, if it's any consolation to you, he seems like a pretty nice guy. Cora, was he around here before I left? No, I told you. He just got in ten days ago. <laughs> I had a feeling I'd seen him someplace before. Well, you might have seen his picture. He's pretty social. Oh, money, too? Joni said he's worth half a million. <laughs> well, <laughs> me and my little 5000 Did you actually go away and earn 5000 Well, I, I didn't really earn it. I, hmm? I got lucky. Oh. Uh. I went out on a trail and found a man with a broken leg. What? He turned out to own half of Pittsburgh. Oh. <laughs> the 5000 was a reward. Uh, where did all this happen? At a place called Great Bear. Oh. Hey. Huh? I just remembered. W what? Did you say that guy was worth half a million? Well, that's what he told Joni. I've got to get a hold of her right away. <laughs> Just put those snowshoes by the door. Okay, Lieutenant. You get yours off, Leon? Yeah, just to loosen the straps. There we are. Why? 
Well, let's go into the cabin and take a look around. All right. Go ahead, boys. Thanks. After you, Jim. Thanks, man. Hey, you better, better keep our coats on. This isn't going to be any too warm in here. Ah. Say, uh, Lieutenant, didn't I see some telephone wires outside? Yeah, you did. The phone is right in there in the bedroom. Oh. Lay on. Yes, Jim. Why don't you call the phone company, see if they have any record of outgoing calls from here after the girl's death. Huh? Right. Well, Lieutenant, suppose we look around. All right. I don't know what we'll find, though. My men have already searched the place. Oh? Uh-huh. Yeah. Say, did your laboratory have any word on how the girl met her death? No, not yet. I said they'd have something for me later in the day, though. Oh, good. What was left behind her? Well, that scarf, hairbrush, and that little box camera. Box camera, huh? Yeah. They probably took some snapshots. Say, there uh, could be a picture of the husband. We didn't find any. Mm. Well, they might not have had a chance to get the pictures back yet. Where would you go around here to have pictures developed? Why, several places in the village. Camera shop, drugstore. Uh-huh. Now, when we finish here, I'm going down there. <laughs> It isn't necessary. Well, I, I realize now it was pretty stupid. Thanks for calling, Ralph. Oh, wait. I, I have something else to talk to you about. I uh, understand you're living at a cabin. Yes. Could I come and see you? I don't think Tom would like that. Well, this is about him. What do you mean? Cora told me that you said he was very wealthy, worth half a million dollars. That's right. Did you just make that up? Of course not. You really believe it? Yes, Why? Because I saw him less than a month ago at a resort called Great Bear. He was a clerk in a ski shop. Oh, that's ridiculous. I'm telling you, Joan, it's the truth. Look, I have a feeling that instead of you marrying his money, he's marrying yours. Ralph, I'm not going to listen to any more of this. Goodbye. Leon. Leon, over here. Jim, I've got the information we need. Oh, good. There was a long-distance call made from the telephone in the cabin 11 days ago to the Twin Lakes Lodge at Twin Lakes. Uh-huh. Uh, how did your theory work out about the pictures? Well, the druggist said there weren't any pictures here in the name of Mrs. Jones, but the theory paid off anyway. Mrs. Jones brought a roll of film in to be developed before she was married, and they were here in the name of Mary Travis. Here, Leon, take a look at them. Yeah. Now, six of them are pictures of Miss Travis. These last two, there they are. Those are Jones. But, uh, Jim, he's bent over, skiing. Can't see his face. How do you know it's Jones? Oh, here. Take a look here. See that scarf he has around his neck? Uh huh. Well, Jones left it at the cabin when he cleared out, along with a hairbrush and the camera that took these pictures. Left a hairbrush? That's right. It might be very valuable. No? I just called the office. They've gotten a report from the lab. They found some fragments of skin under the girl's fingernails. Must have been a struggle before she died, then. Yes. They also discovered a few blonde hairs. Wow. Oh. We'll ask Lieutenant Henderson to take the hairbrush in the town for us and see if those blonde hairs match any that are in that hairbrush. Okay. Oh, uh, did you talk to the Twin Lakes Lodge? Yes. And? There's nobody staying there by the name of Fred Jones. But the reservation clerk remembers getting a phone call from Great Bear on the day the call was made from the cabin. Uh Uh-huh. The reason he remembered was the man who called merely wanted to know if there were any rooms available. He, He didn't want to make a reservation over the phone. Well, that was probably Jones. I guess he wanted some time to assume his new name and identity. Well, Leon, let's take these pictures with us and drive over to Twin Lakes. Just a minute. Ralph. Oh, brother, am I glad you're here. Wait, you can't come in. I've got to. But, Ralph, Tom... Joan, I came all the way out to your cabin to tell you about Tom. I don't want to hear that story again. Now get out. No, this is a different story. Your husband's a murderer. What? I called Great Bear, spoke to the ski shop. I wanted to verify the fact that I'd seen him there. They told me the police were looking for him. He's wanted for killing his wife. Oh, Ralph, you've been drinking. No, I'm cold sober, and this is the truth. He killed his wife for her money. 
I came out here to see that he didn't give the same treatment to you. That was very huh? considerate. Tom, did you hear what he's been telling me? Yes. I apologize for it. He forced his way in here. Well, and he's getting thrown out. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm sober this time. I think you'll find it a little harder. Well, let's try. Oh, oh God, that you do. Please stop it, I said. All right, you two, break it up. We better separate him, Jerry. Come on, you. Come on, take it easy. Who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. We're looking for this man here. He's my husband. Well, I've got a warrant for his arrest. He's wanted on suspicion of murder. Jones, alias Tom Chandler, was tried in federal court for murder on a government reservation, found guilty and sentenced to be executed. Upon arriving at the Twin Lakes Lodge, Special Agent Taylor showed the skiing picture of Jones to several people at the hotel. Although his face was hidden, his unusual ski jacket was recognized as belonging to a guest named Tom Chandler. Special Agent Taylor then learned that Tom Chandler had been a guest at the Twin Lakes Lodge and that he had checked in the very day that Fred Jones left Great Bear. Piecing those bits of information together gave him enough to assume that Tom Chandler and Fred Jones were one and the same person. When a sample of Jones' hair proved to be identical with the strands of hair found under the fingernails of the late Mrs. Jones, and also with some hair found in the hairbrush left at the cabin, it proved to be sufficient evidence for a conviction. By combining thorough investigation with the invaluable help they received from the local police and also from the FBI crime laboratory, the two special agents were able to close another case and to close it successfully with the arrest, not of the suspect, but of the real criminal. Just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, a question that may surprise you. Did you know that a man is known by the life insurance he owns? In other words, when you purchase the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up, you automatically demonstrate that you're that type of person, that you, you really do have faith in yourself and your future. So, don't belittle yourself by making small plans. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative soon and ask him to give you facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A factual case history of a manhunt in the great southwest. Its subject, armed robbery. Its title, The Cutrate Caravan. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Cut Rate Caravan on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.